I have talked about um, how an optimization algorithm has an objective function, uh, constraints and decision variables and I have related all of these to the control viewpoint and then I also talked about how we get a discrete model of the process so that we can put together this model predictive control formulation. So in this lecture, I will quickly uh, combine all of these together to show you how the optimization formulation is put together. And the beauty of this uh, model predictive control formulation is that since we have an optimization formulation and not an analytical expression for the control uh, law, uh, any optimizer can be used to solve this problem. So if you find a more efficient optimizer, uh, you can simply use this formulation with that optimizer. So the accent in terms of uh, the model predictive control material uh, is more on the concepts of formulation and how do we formulate this problem rather than the solution which is a standard optimization solution that you can use. In fact, uh, this makes it very nice because um, we can come up with various uh, nuances and uh, uh, enhancements in the formulation. And while we are doing this, we do not have to really worry about how we are going to solve this, right? So ultimately, once you put all of this together, if you have an efficient optimizer that can solve the class of problems that you are interested in solving from a model predictive control viewpoint, you simply give it to the solver to solve it. So in that sense, in some sense, the solution to the formulation is kind of decoupled uh, to some extent uh, from the formulation that makes it easier for us to conceptualize this formulation better. So uh, I'm going to recap uh, some of the things that uh, we have seen as part of this module. Uh, so here is one picture which talks about how this um, model is used. So for example, if you have an output at the kth time instant, then that is working uh, with this envelope here, which basically says to predict yk, you need to know uk minus 1, uk minus 2 all the way up to uk minus gamma. Now, if you want to predict yk plus 1, what you do is you simply move this one step ahead and also this envelope is moved one step ahead. So if I want to predict yk plus 1, you look at this envelope here. So I need to know uk, uk minus 1, uk minus 2 all the way up to uk minus gamma plus 1 because we have slided this up one more. Similarly, if I want to look at yk plus 2, I look at this envelope here. So I slide this one, slide this one. So I need values for uk minus gamma plus 2 all the way up to uk plus 1 for me to be able to predict yk plus 2. So this goes on. So if I am at time k, I still can write these expressions for yk plus 1, yk plus 2 in terms of inputs that have already occurred which are here an input that I am going to make now and future input. So this is the key idea which we have talked about quite a bit. So in other words, if I am interested in um, uh, controlling my system and looking at how I am going to take my output values close to set points in the future starting from yk plus 1, yk plus 2 and so on. Basically what it says is I can write these as functions of the current manipulated variable value that I should keep and uh, future manipulated variable values I should keep. So I can write this as a function of these manipulated variable values which is what we have already talked about quite a bit uh, in this series. So now we have everything to put together this optimization uh, formulation. As a recap, we are at the time t equal to k and whatever control move that we are going to make at k, k plus 1, uh, k plus 2 and so on. These will affect outputs in the future. So they will start affecting the outputs at k plus 1 given k, k plus 2 given k. I already talked about given k meaning we are at time t equal to k. Okay? So these outputs up to yk plus p are going to be affected by the choices that I make. And the way I make my choices is that I am going to make a choice for uk, uk plus 1, uk plus 2 all the way up to uk plus m minus 1. That means I am making m choices here. And then what I am saying is after I make this choice here, then I am going to say I am not going to make any more choices. I am going to let the input be at the same value. Okay? So when we formulate this, all we need to find is values for uk, uk plus 1, uk plus 2 all the way up to uk plus m minus 1. Those m values if I find, 
then I know that u k uh, plus m is the same as u k plus m minus 1 and so on till the end okay, till the prediction horizon. And we also said that it does not really make sense to go beyond the prediction horizon because a change that I make here will only affect an output after this, but our prediction horizon itself stops here. And if you assume uh, the systems are causal, strictly causal, then up to k plus p minus 1 you could have kept making these choices, but we use this as a tuning parameter and then say though I could make choices up to k plus p minus 1 to affect all the way up to k plus p of the output, I am going to stop at k plus uh, m minus 1 just uh, as a matter of convenience and I am going to use uh, this m itself as a tuning parameter in my MPC formulation. So, that is what we uh, decide to do here. So, if you notice then we think about putting all of this together as an optimization formulation. We see that we can define an objective function here which says in all future time instants whatever is the y that has to be very close to y set point. So, I am going to say y k plus i minus y set point squared would allow me to have this y k plus i from i 1 to p uh, be close to the y set point. And not only that we also say uh, at the same time I do not want to make too much uh, control moves. So, I am going to kind of trade off both of these. So, this is the objective that I come up with. I could have simply come up with just this first term also it does not matter. Uh, this is a more generalized formulation and of course, you can make this even more general by adding terms for delta u and so on. So, that will not only say that I do not want to make very big uh, control values, but at each instant I do not also want to make very big changes. So, if I want to have uh, you know constraints that I want to impose on this, uh, then um, I could either uh, put them in constraints here or I could add them uh, in the objective function and since I am minimizing this all this um, uh, delta u changes will also be uh, minimized. Okay. So, there are two options, but traditionally people can put this in the objective function and then weight these various um, objective function terms and then correspondingly tune uh, how aggressive I want my controller to be and so on. So, typically these two terms are definitely used you could also use a third term delta u and on top of it uh, while you use it in the objective function you can also uh, put some constraints on u and delta u as a part of constraints also it does not matter. Uh, remember the most important thing is once we have converted this into an optimization formulation then you can pretty much uh, do any of these things you want you can add any number of constraints and so on as long as you are able to pose problems that are solvable and meaningful. Now, when you look at this, so we talked about the uh, objective function, we, we talked about uh, constraints maybe on u, delta u and so on. And the third aspect of the objective function, um, uh, the third uh, aspect of the optimization formulation are the decision variables. And in this case, clearly I have to make a decision about u k, I have to make a decision about u k plus 1, k plus 2, uh, k plus m minus 1. So, in a single variable case, I have this m decision variables that I have to choose. However, if you look at this formulation it looks as if these do not participate here at all other than here it does not participate here. But remember these terms or these decision variables participate here through the model. So, that is the key idea because depending on how I change my manipulated variable values the output is going to change. So, y k plus 1 will depend on u k, y k plus 2 will depend on u k and u k plus 1, y k plus 3 will depend on u k, u k plus 1, u k plus 2 and so on. Right? So, that dependence on the moves that I am going to make in the future and the current move that I am going to make is captured by the model. So, if I put this model into this term here, then you will see the decision variables not only come in the second term, the decision variables also come in the first term. So, this whole objective function you can think of as some function of u k, u k plus 1 all the way up to u k plus m minus 1. So, 
The reason why I am writing it this way is I am showing to you that we have now got it into an optimization form where it is a function of these m decision variables I give it to an optimizer and the optimizer will give me the values for these m decision variables. So, the model comes in this here and that is where the model uh, part of the model predictive control uh, is relevant. The predictive part is here. So, how many outputs into the future that I am going to predict and that is the predictive part here in model predictive control and the control part is actually I am trying to find out what values I should keep for this u k, u k plus 1 all the way up to u k plus m minus 1, right. So, these are the control inputs. So, once I identify these values, then I can actually control my system. That is where the control part of this model predictive control comes into picture. So, you see how this is different from uh, your standard PID control in the sense that there is a prediction horizon. It is not just immediate concern I have. I have a concern about optimizing over a prediction horizon and I am explicitly using a model for doing this control. I showed this before in one of the lectures just to kind of bring that back here so that we understand all of this uh, comes together uh, in model predictive control. Remember I showed you that if you had a multiple uh, variable um, optimization there is this subjective function there are two decision variables you can write this dou f dou x 1 dou equal to 0 dou f dou x 2 equal to 0 and get two equations to solve for this. Similarly, in the model predictive control formulation based on what we saw in the last uh, slide I said the objective function can be written as some function of u k u k plus 1 all the way up to u k plus m minus 1. So, this function has both the model and the other terms and all that which we saw. Now, if I want to optimize this then I have to do dou objective by dou u k is 0, dou objective by dou u k plus 1 is 0 and so on and I will get dou objective by dou u k plus m minus 1 equal 0. So, I will get my m equations in these m variables and then if I solve for this I will get my m values and then uh, if you formulate it right it will happen that the second order condition will be automatically satisfied uh, that basically means if I keep these values for these control variables that would essentially optimize my objective function it will actually minimize my objective function which means that I am going to be able to follow the set point trajectory uh, as closely as the system would allow me to do while not expending very high control uh, effort. So, I have the two terms and I can uh, based on the application uh, emphasize one term, uh, de-emphasize the other term and so on. So, that is how all of this works together. So, in terms of an algorithm what happens is you start uh, and choose a control horizon m, you choose uh, a prediction horizon p and m has to be less than p which we have talked about quite a bit. Let us assume that we are at time t equal to k. So, what we are looking for is we are looking for these variables to be optimized and these output uh, values to be very close to set point. So, which is reflected by this part of the objective function and at the same time we want to ensure that the control moves are not very dramatic. Now, we said this objective function is a function of u k, u k plus 1 all the way up to u k plus m minus 1. So, you optimize this, this is where you simply give it to a solver. So, we are talking about a formulation here and the actual solution is really sent to an optimization solver which will solve for this and then it will give you the optimal control moves u star k up to u star k plus m minus 1. Notice that all of these control moves you are going to get at time t equal to k. So, at time t equal to k you really need only one decision to be made right which is I have to implement a control move here. So, what you will do is you will implement this okay, and then wait and then you will go to t equal to k plus 1 and you will repeat this process and so on and you will keep controlling your process. So, that is the way MPC algorithm works. Now, one question that you could ask is if I am going to implement only one control move, why, do they, why did I compute uh, all of these uh, control moves at time k? So, I will answer this question uh, through two important points that I want to make. The first one is forget why we compute all of this uh, at t equal to k, 
but let us see what makes sense in terms of implementation, right. So, if I am sitting at time t equal to k and I have what is called this move plan which is I have u star for k all the way up to u star k plus m minus 1, one option is to not look at this process till u t equal to k plus m and then simply implement this move plan and keep implementing this move plan and then once this move plan is exhausted again do a batch of move plans and then keep doing that. So, that is one option. The disadvantage with that option is the following. Uh, when we make this decision for this move plan, we are sitting at time t equal to k. So, all the information that I have till now with me has been collected till time t equal to k and I made my move plan, right. Now, at t equal to k plus 1, I have got more information, right, because I have got another output value y k plus 1, right. And at t equal to k plus 2, I got even more information, I have y k plus 2. Now, if I stick to my original move plan, then all this information that is coming in the future, I am simply going to ignore, I am not going to take advantage of this. So, it is something like this, supposing you are trying to study for an exam and you think that the exam is very hard and you decide that you are going to put a lot of uh, effort and you are going to solve some sample papers and then see how well you will do in your exam. Let us say you start studying today and you plan for a week and so after one day of studying you take a sample paper and do this, right. Now, if you find a sample paper very easy, right, you cannot stick to your original plan, right, you will calibrate based on whatever happened uh, one day later your study pattern, right, because there are other exams that you want to do well. So, maybe you will reapportion time uh, depending on where you are doing well, where you are not doing well and so on. Similarly, if you did very poorly in the sample paper, then you know the effort that you have planned for this is not enough, so you will redo this. So, in that sense, it makes most sense to basically keep re-evaluating what is happening and not stick to your original uh, ideas and as and when there is new information that comes in, in real life what we will do is we will recalibrate our plans and thinking based on that new information, right. If I say I am going to play for the next uh, one week uh, cricket and it starts raining, clearly you cannot do it. So, we have to reevaluate plan, maybe I cannot play cricket, I have to do something else and so on, right. So, that is an important idea for having a move plan, right and um, only implementing the first move. Now, let us ask the flip question and say if I have uh, uh, only one plan move that I am going to implement, why, why do I find all of this uh, values is another question you could ask. So, here uh, you can show this theoretically, but I am going to appeal to a uh, little bit of intuition to explain this to you. This m you choose can be used as a tuning parameter. Uh, to make the controller more or less aggressive, okay. So, if you have more moves in your bag, you can make the controller a little less aggressive than if you have a single move that you are making every time or you think you are going to make every time. So, the idea is the following, supposing you are in a room, you are at, uh, at one edge of the room, let us say you want to uh, reach the other end of the room and if I told you, you can jump 10 times and reach the other end of the room, what you will do is you will take measured jumps and go to the other end of the room. However, if I said okay, you have only one move to jump to the other end of the room, what you are going to do is you are going to really try and jump very hard. So, you are going to be very aggressive about your jumping, right. So, that is the same thing that happens in controllers. So, if I say I have only one move that I am going to calculate, but there are uh, several predictions in the future, I have to make them close to set point then your controller is going to be quite aggressive. So, that aggressiveness in the controller could be traded off by uh, choosing this m, a very long m will make your controller less aggressive, very short m will make your controller uh, more aggressive and so on. Now, one last thing which is uh, something that I wanted to talk about, um, the, the, the great thing about MPC is it does not matter whether it is a single variable problem or a multiple variable problem it very easily extends to multivariate problems. So, here I am showing a case where if you have two outputs and two inputs, 
what will happen is we were only looking at this portion for single input. Now when you have multiple inputs and multiple outputs for each output you will also add on the effect of the other input and you will also add the other outputs and the effect of this input here and this input here. Now notice how this is structured right all of this simply adds on because we are assuming the underlying processes to be linear. So it is a very very simple extension to multivariate cases. Now uh, in the multivariate case what will happen is everything else will remain the same except now uh, if I had single variable and a control horizon of m I had m decision variables. If I have two uh, inputs and if I have a, a prediction horizon of m then I left two m decision variables to choose uh, values for m uh, values for u1 in from the current move till m uh, k plus m minus 1 and m values to choose for u2 from the current k to k plus m minus 1 okay. So basically everything else remains the same except that the number of decision variables that you are going to use increases uh, by corresponding to the number of uh, inputs that you are going to use. So once that is done then everything else uh, is done in the same way. So this is one of the major attractions of MPC because uh, when you go from CISO to MIMO control you do not need much more sophistication the basic ideas simply translate. So in terms of uh, a summary uh, the unique features of MPC uh, that help us are use of an explicit model, use of a moving horizon and explicit optimization to calculate control modes. This is something we have talked quite a bit about. The advantages are easy to incorporate constraints I talked to you about extension to multivariable case is straightforward which I showed you in the last slide and extension to nonlinear problems is also straightforward because remember at the beginning of this lecture I said we can make the formulation however complicated we want right we can take a model which is nonlinear. So from a formulation viewpoint nothing is going to change except that instead of a linear model I am going to say there is a nonlinear model. So we kind of move all the burden of solving to solvers and you have lots of people working on solving different types of optimization problems, complicated optimization problems, convex, non-convex problems and so on. So you can basically take advantage of um, all the um, advancements that are taking place in the optimization area and then uh, use that in solving MPC problems. So in that sense I do not have to generate new theory if I want to solve non-linear problems. Whereas traditional approaches whenever you go to a non-linear problem you are forced to develop a new theory and the new theory will depend on the type of nonlinearity you are looking at and so on and there will be lots of restrictions in terms of uh, what kind of nonlinearities can be addressed, uh, how do you address them so you, you will require different tools for different types of uh, nonlinear problems and so on. So we kind of get rid of all of this, uh, when I say get rid of we, we kind of push everything to the optimizer and from a formulation viewpoint we have a clean idea of what we are trying to do. So with that this uh, portion on uh, model predictive controller uh, is complete and you will also have a tutorial on how to implement uh, MPC uh, controller on a simple example, thank you.